the anterior subomohyoid approach to the suprascapular nerve block. The shoulder joint is a complex joint with multiple innervations. The anterior joint capsule is innervated by the subscapular nerves, the axillary and the lateral pectoral nerves, while the posterior joint capsule is innervated by the suprascapular and the axillary nerves. The suprascapular nerve is the most important nerve to supply the shoulder joint. The suprascapular nerve has motor and joint sensory innervation with very little cutaneous innervation. The motor innervation includes the supraspinatus muscle and the infraspinatus muscle. The major branch is the superior articular branch which provides innervation to the coracoclavicular, the coracohumeral ligaments as well as the acromioclavicular glenohumeral joints and the subacromial bursa. There is very little and variable cutaneous innervation of the suprascapular nerve, which is limited to a small area close to the infraspinatus muscle. This video shows the anatomy of the brachial plexus in the interscalene groove. The brachial plexus is formed by the C5 to T1 ventral primary rami, they travel in between the scalenus anterior and the scalenus medius in the interscalene groove. Once the sternomastoid muscle is reflected, we're able to see the roots and trunks of the brachial plexus sandwiched between the scalene muscles. The suprascapular nerve is formed by the C5 and C6 nerve roots joining to form the superior trunk and it is the first lateral branch of the superior trunk, which can be seen after removing the anterior scalene muscle. The suprascapular nerve travels inferiorly and under the omohyoid to reach the supraspinous fossa. On removing the trapezius muscle, we could see that the omohyoid muscle attaches itself to the superior lip of the scapula with the suprascapular artery going above and the suprascapular nerve going below the omohyoid muscle through the scapular notch to enter the supraspinous fossa. Here, it provides innervation to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscles. The superior articular branch provides innervation to the acromioclavicular and glenohumeral joints, mainly to the posterior capsule. When the omohyoid muscle is removed, you could see the suprascapular nerve in its full entirety. It travels in the scapular notch below the transverse scapular ligament, whereas the artery and the vein travel above the transverse scapular ligament. After entering the supraspinous fossa, it uh, continues down in the spinoglenoid notch uh, to innervate the infraspinatus muscle and also to provide an inferior articular branch. Suprascapular nerve, after it leaves the superior trunk, travels in the intermediate space between the cervical fascia and the prevertebral fascia. This is where it is amenable to blockade in the anterior approach. The indications to perform a suprascapular nerve block are for analgesia of after scapular fracture, after reduction for a shoulder dislocation, and for arthroscopic and open joint surgery for total shoulder replacements and also for chronic pain involving the shoulder joint. Even though the gold standard for pain management after shoulder surgery remains the interscalene block, there's a significantly high incidence of hemidiaphragmatic paresis, which could be detrimental in a small subgroup of patients. The search has always been there for a diaphragm sparing block of which the most worthy alternative seems to be the combined suprascapular and axillary nerve block. In this study by Newts et al., the interscalene block wins in the short term, in the less, less than four hours post-operative period, the usage of opiates and the pain scores are substantially lesser, but after four hours, the differences start to become smaller. After eight hours, there's very little difference, and in 24 hours, both interscalene as well as the combined suprascapular axillary block have similar pain scores and opiate consumption. What is of note is the combined suprascapular axillary block is associated with a lower incidence of dyspnea and discomfort. 
Similar results were obtained by this group comparing the suprascapular and axillary block with interscalene block for shoulder surgery. The interscalene block again works much better in the short immediate post-operative period in the post anesthetic care unit where the pain scores are better with less opioid requirements. But after six hours, there's very marginal difference between these two groups. What these study group had identified was also that at 24 hours, the pain relief was better with the combined suprascapular and axillary nerve blocks. This systematic review by Hussein et al has also confirmed the similar findings from the previous two studies, which showed that the interscalene block and suprascapular block were not different in terms of their morphine consumption in the first 24 hour period. Compared with the suprascapular block, the interscalene block fared much better in the pain scores, lower pain scores in the post anesthetic care unit, but the differences in opiate consumption were not there. And at any other time frames, the pain scores were not much different, whereas the suprascapular block had a very reduced incidence of complications. The classical approach to do the suprascapular nerve block is the posterior approach in the supraspinous fossa. The ultrasound landmark to aid identification is the suprascapular notch. From this narrative review by Chen et al., the suprascapular notch cannot be seen in up to 15% of the patients where there can be no notch or the notch could be a, a foramen. So the ultrasound landmark can not be reliable. The first description of the ultrasound guided anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve block was done by Bernard Morigal and Siegenthaler. They first tested their hypothesis by trying to identify the nerve in volunteers in the supraclavicular region and compared it with identification of the nerve in the suprascapular region. The suprascapular nerve was consistently identified a lot more and much more superficial at a depth of 8 millimeter in the anterior approach compared to only 36% of the examinations at a much deeper level of nearly 35 millimeters. They followed it up with a cadaver study where they injected dye, 0.1 ml of dye, into the suprascapular nerve and then had a dissection. They were able to successfully place the needle close to the suprascapular nerve in 95% of the cadavers that was tested. And even with 0.1 ml of dye injected, they could stain the suprascapular nerve, but in 1 in 20 cases, the brachial plexus was stained as well. The median distance from the suprascapular nerve to the brachial plexus was around 9 millimeter in the volunteers and around 8 millimeters in the cadavers. In this cadaveric study of the anterior sub approach to the suprascapular nerve block by Sehembi et al., the suprascapular nerve was stained in a very high proportion of the cadaveric dissections, 90%, after an injection of 5 mL of dye. What was also identified was that a high proportion of the brachial plexus gets stained with even a volume as little as 5 mL. The superior trunk in 90%, middle trunk in 80%, and the inferior trunk in 20%. What was also of note was the phrenic nerve was stained also in 20% of the cases. So what they concluded was that more, more studies are needed to identify the optimal volume and also the potential for blockade of the phrenic nerve even with the anterior approach. In this randomized control trial by Ayong et al. comparing continuous interscalene supraclavicular and anterior suprascapular block for total joint replacement, which is shoulder replacement, where the authors did not use a bolus but only a continuous infusion and then studied the mean reductions in the vital capacity, the diaphragmatic excursion, and the pain scores and opiate consumption at 24 hours. What this group identified was the interscalene block 
produces the greatest reduction in the mean vital capacity compared with the suprascapular block where they have 82% of the baseline vital capacity. The ultrasound measured diaphragmatic excursion was reduced significantly in the interscalene group as compared with the suprascapular group, but there was no great differences or statistically significant difference in the pain scores or opiate consumption at 24 hours. So from this study, we can conclude that the anterior approach produces less impairment of diaphragmatic function compared to an interscalene block. So in summary, the anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve block is easily identifiable, is very superficial and has a high success rate of needle placement. But the disadvantage of the anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve block is predominantly because of the proximity of the brachial plexus and the phrenic nerve. As seen in the cadaver studies, a high proportion of the superior and middle trunk can get blocked by this technique and similarly the phrenic nerve in a very small proportion of the patients and and in for the same reasons radio frequency and neuroablative procedures cannot be undertaken in this location because of the proximity of the pleura and lack of a bony protection needle alignment is particularly paramount in the anterior approach to avoid a pneumothorax in this scanning video with the linear high frequency transducer placed at the level of C5 in the interscalene groove, you could identify the C5 nerve root emerging out from the transverse process. And then this, the C6 transverse anterior tubercle, the prominent chest tubercle, and the C6 nerve root coming out. And as the probe is moved further inferiorly, you could see the C7 transverse process and the vertebral artery medially. And this is the typical interscalene groove sandwiched between the two scalene muscles. And as the probe is moved more inferiorly, you could see the transverse cervical artery pulsations and the entry into the supraclavicular region with the rib and the pleura and the supraclavicular brachial plexus. The omohyoid muscle is seen as a linear band and the suprascapular nerve is seen to emerge from the superior trunk and move far laterally and posteriorly. And as the probe is moved backward, we could see the suprascapular nerve join back with the superior trunk underneath the omohyoid muscle. This ultrasound image in the supraclavicular region shows the subclavian artery, the pleura, and the rib, the scalenius medius muscle, and the supraclavicular brachial plexus. The superior trunk is seen to split with the suprascapular nerve separating out and traversing under the omohyoid to travel posteriorly. The suprascapular nerve, after it splits from the superior trunk, is sandwiched between the superficial cervical fascia and the prevertebral fascia. So the injection of local anesthetic is typically done under the omohyoid and under the superficial cervical fascia to surround the suprascapular nerve. The ultrasound guided anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve block is done similar to the supraclavicular nerve block with the patient in the supine position, head turns towards the contralateral side a 6 to 13 megahertz linear probe and a 50 millimeter stimuflex insulated needle. A in plane lateral to medial approach is used to do the block. A typical volumes of between 2 to 5 ml is enough to block the suprascapular nerve in this location. This is a demonstration of the anterior approach to the suprascapular nerve block. The subclavian artery, the pleura, and the first rib are seen. The needle approaches from a lateral to medial direction under the omohyoid where the suprascapular nerve has branched out from the superior trunk. The needle penetrates the superficial cervical fascia and typical volumes of 2 to 5 mils is enough to surround the 
supra scapular nerve at this location.